Good morning, City View. Won't you stand as we sing this morning? Happy Easter. We're just so glad that you all are here. We've got a lot of voices on stage, but we're expecting a lot from y'all as well. Because the reason why we're here today is the tomb was empty. He is risen. So we take that you take joy in that, in that fact, and just knowing that he is our God. So let's up, lift up a mighty shout to him. Yeah. 
Let's lift this one time. Say, our God reigns. Come on, church. Our God reigns. Forever. the building said our God reign. come on sing this to your king this morning come on church say it our God forever forever your kingdom reign. this is our last one let's do it church say it our God reads after the Sabbath at the first day of the week was dawning Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb there was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb he rolled back the stone and was sitting on it his appearance was like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. The angel told the women, don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Now listen to the next verse. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead. It's uh, such a joy to welcome you this Easter Sunday. Uh, my name is Keith. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, this is my wife, Barry. It's our joy just to welcome you into the City View family this morning and to say, as we always do, I'm going to say, He is risen, and you respond, He is risen indeed. Ready? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And that is why we're celebrate today and I just want to say Ed, no matter what you came in here hearing no matter how hopeless your days are right now the beauty of the resurrection resurrection is to remind us that there the miracle is there and it's coming and no matter how bad your today looks mm. no matter how bad we can have hope knowing that anything is possible because Jesus really did resurrect from the dead yeah he's alive <laughs> Hope, I hope that y'all will all know to come back next week and the week after because I can promise you, I mean, we don't have the choir every week, which I kind of wish we did because this is amazing, <laughs> but our church family, they love Jesus and they love others and you will feel so welcome um, and we would just love to have you come worship with us every week. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a joy to sing with you. Obviously, we've got a full house today. Uh, if you've got an empty seat next to you, if you can squeeze in just as people continue to come in. We want to make sure we have space for them. And uh, we're going to pray over our, our offering today. We're not going to pass an offering bucket today. Uh, we encourage you, if you would like to give to support the ministry of City View, you can do that online. If you brought an offering today, there's offering boxes at the back doors as you leave today. But just because we have a shorter amount of time in our service today, we want to use our time to sing together pray together and to hear God's word. So will you bow with me in prayer and let's continue to worship the Lord. Jesus, we thank you this morning that you are alive. 
that you are the risen Savior. That is very shared, even if we are here this morning and maybe we're in the midst of Good Friday despair or we're in the midst of a silent Saturday moment where we don't know where you are or we can't hear your voice. God, thank you that we have the hope of Resurrection Sunday. We praise you that Jesus has overcome the grave. He's overcome sin. He's overcome death. He's overcome Satan. And that we serve a risen Christ who is reigning on high and is coming again. And so, Jesus, today we pray in this place that you would be exalted and lifted high. The Bible says that as we lift you high, you will draw all people to yourself. And so, God, I pray that no matter where we are as we come in this place today, we would meet the risen Jesus and we would be transformed and changed forever because Jesus is real, Jesus is alive, and he is coming again. God, we pray now, would you pour out your spirit in this place? Would you meet with us as we lift our voices to sing your praises and as we open your word to hear from you? God, we love you, we worship you, and we are so excited to be here on Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.
Thank you, Lord. Now, I won't try to catch y'all breath. That's cold for us catching our breath. And we're going to sing this one again. He is what? Go! He is All right, that was rehearsal. We got one more to go. You ready? Let's go! that not only will we celebrate in this room but God that even as we go in our daily lives that people will see resurrection in us and we thank you and we give you glory we say Lord have your way as Pastor Keith shares what you've given him to share with us and we submit this time to you in Jesus name we pray Truly, what a joy, what a privilege to get to be together, to worship together on Easter Sunday. Amen? Amen. Uh, let us never take it for granted that we have the freedom to come together and to sing and to praise God, to pray together, to open up the scriptures together. What a gift and uh, what a privilege. So what a joy to be here with all of you. How about our choir this morning? Rocking the house, huh? <laughs> And they've already heard this sermon once. They get it three times today. Y'all don't, don't be preaching my sermon for me by the third time. Well, we want you, if you're new to City View, to feel at home here. And uh, after service, uh, there's a welcome desk out in the lobby. And our, our team is there to help you get connected into the life of our church. In fact, our next Discover City View uh, class starts next Sunday, and so if you'd like to get signed up for that or just get some more information about the church, uh, our team would love to meet you after the service this morning. You know, we all know what it feels like to compete for a prize. Uh, we are in the middle of March Madness right now, the battle to be the best collegiate basketball team in the nation. And we watch all of these young athletes competing to win. They, they know what prize they're going for. They want to uh, get that trophy. They want to be able to cut down the net. Uh, they're, they're excited pursuing the fame, the accolades that go with that. And many of us are also following March Madness, but not because we love college basketball or even know anything about any of these teams but because you filled out a bracket yourself and you're in your own competition, right? You've got your own prize you're going after, right? And that is the prize of bragging rights <laughs> that you won the, the office pool or the family competition and you're not gonna get a trophy, but you're hoping you get that little, you know, uh, lottery of that, that money that was pulled together for winning the, the best bracket. Sports are fun because they are a metaphor for life. In the game of life, we, we know that we are in a race. We know that there is a destination we are headed to, and we have to know what goal we are pursuing. We've got to know what race are we running. 
I taught at the beginning of this series in the book of Philippians, it's important to have a spiritual running partner. Someone that comes alongside you, that helps you to keep going and to never give up. But I would submit to you this morning that it's even more important to know what race you are running and what prize you are pursuing. Are y'all with me this morning, church? All right. Talk to me this morning. Talk to me. So many people I meet are disappointed in this life because they have committed themselves to running after the wrong prize. What prize are you pursuing in life? Is it the prize of wealth? Do you have a number in your mind? (laughs) Once you get that amount in your retirement plan, your bank account, your savings account, then you will be content. Then you will have joy. Is it the prize of approval and accolades? If you just get enough followers on social media, enough likes, enough retweets, then you will have arrived. Is it the prize of a relationship? If I can just get this person to like me, to go out with me, to marry me, then I will be at peace. When I say, what prize are you going after? I want you to answer this question. You ready? Here's the question. What is the one thing that you believe in your heart, if you had it, you would finally be happy and content and your life would have meaning and joy? What is it? Now be careful because if you make anything in this life, in this world, your ultimate hope, you are setting yourself up for disappointment and disillusionment. The final prize cannot be something in this life because everything in this world, listen to me, fades away quickly. The final prize must be something else. The Apostle Paul knew a little bit about human accomplishments. If you remember the passage from last week, he listed off all of the things he had achieved, all the things in this world that had made him somebody. And then he said this, I now consider all of those things to be lost for the gain of knowing Christ. You see, he had been running one race and he met the living Christ And then he got on a new path. He started a different race. After he met Jesus, he realized, wait a minute, I'm pursuing the wrong things. He came to recognize he was running the wrong race, pursuing the wrong destination. He was seeking a temporary prize instead of a eternal one. My prayer for each of you is that this Easter you would make sure you're running the right race, pursuing the ultimate prize. I cannot imagine a worse feeling than getting to the end of your life only to realize you have spent all of your time, all of your effort, all of your passion, all of your money, all of your hard work pursuing something that won't last. It would be like running a 26-mile marathon only to get to the end And realize you had been going the wrong direction the whole way. Can you imagine that? Crossing that finish line and there's nobody there? You're like, what was my time? We don't know. What race were you running? How many of us are doing just that? Friends, my encouragement to you this year, Easter Sunday 2024, is the perfect day to take stock of your life. To be honest in personal reflection, what race am I running? What prize am I pursuing? In today's Bible passage from the second half of Philippians 3, Paul shares about how he sees his own race now as a follower of Jesus, and then he speaks to all of us about the race we are running. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Philippians 3. We're going to start in verse 12 and read to chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, If you are comfortable and you've just gotten situated, now it's time to stand again. Will you stand with me for the reading of God's word? We like to stand here when we read the scriptures together just to remind one another, this is God's word, not Keith's word, and we want to submit to what he says. This is the word of the Lord to us today, Philippians 3, starting in verse 12. Not that I have already reached the goal or I'm already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have 
taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. For I have often told you and now say again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. They are focused on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, in this manner, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. God, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that you would help us to understand it and apply it to our lives. And Lord, I pray that you, by your spirit, would show each person who's hearing this message today what race they are running, and what prize they're pursuing. In Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much. I want to share with you today about Paul's race, about his encouragement for us, about the right race for us, and then his warning to us about the wrong race. So three races. Paul's race the right race, and the wrong one. Let's start with Paul's race in verses 12 to 14. He starts with the first person singular. Did you notice? He says, I, 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 I. He's talking about how he understands his own walk with the Lord. Now, if you're new to this book or you're new to the story of the Apostle Paul, this is later in his ministry where he is writing to the church at Philippi and he's telling them about how he understands where he is currently at in his walk with the Lord. In the paragraph we read last week, he says he was looking forward to the resurrection from the dead that he would experience because he knew Jesus had risen from the dead and one day he would rise, but he was waiting for that day. While he waits, he wants us to know how he sees his own current spiritual journey, his own race. Notice what Paul says about himself. First, he is aware of his own sinfulness. Notice the phrase. He says, I have not already reached the goal. I'm running the race, but I'm not to the end yet. I'm not perfect. This was very important to Paul's race. He is aware of his own sinfulness and his own limitations. Think about this. Even after being a minister of the gospel for years, Paul knows he's not perfect. This would be extremely helpful for all of us to remember. That even after you have been a Christian for many, many years been studying your Bible, serving in the church, and doing ministry, it is very dangerous to think you have already arrived. It's important to remember that God is still working on you. If you think you are perfect and without sin, you are running the wrong race. If you think you have arrived spiritually, I don't need God's grace anymore in my life. He owes me because if I do all these things for him, you are running the wrong race. Yes, we know. We are not perfected until we go to be with Jesus. This self-awareness of our own spiritual state and our own heart keeps us grounded in reality. And I would say to all of you, if you don't keep this in mind, it will keep you from taking responsibility for yourself. You'll blame everybody else for all of your problems. But if you're like Paul and you're on the right path, you will understand, wait a minute, I have done this, I have thought this, I have said this, and I need God's help in my life. Paul knows that where he is in his spiritual journey, he still has room to grow. 
Second, Paul is so grateful for the grace of God in his life. I love the line where he says, I have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Yes, he's running after Jesus. He's running this race to grow, to become more like Jesus. But Paul knows the only reason he's even in that race is because Jesus got a hold of him. He says, I wasn't running after Jesus. In fact, if you know Paul's story, he was persecuting followers of Jesus. He was as anti-Christian as you could get. And yet one day on the road to Damascus, in Acts chapter 9 tells us that Jesus came and invaded his life, knocked him down, blinded him, and Jesus got a hold of Paul. Paul says, now I'm pursuing Jesus because Jesus pursued me. It's very important for all of us to understand that if we're on the right path in pursuing the Lord, it's because of God's grace. It's not because we're super spiritual or we're super mature because we figured it all out. It's because God in his kindness and his grace, he invaded our lives and he changed us. This is an important part of the Christian journey, gratitude for God's grace. We're not running this race to earn God's mercy, earn God's love. We receive his love and his mercy because of his grace poured out on us. And then the whole Christian race, the whole Christian life is a response to God's love and his mercy. Third, Paul says about his race, he's leaving the past behind. Can we get an amen on that? He says, I'm forgetting what is behind and I'm reaching forward to what is ahead. Dealing with your past is hard, amen? Amen. So many of us in this room, we struggle with our past. Things that have happened to us, things that we've done. And we struggle to get past that, to move on from that, to move forward. And the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of what Jesus did through the cross, through his death, through his resurrection, is, listen, is that he, by his blood, wipes away our past. We are no longer what has happened to us in the past. We have a new identity, we have a new path, we have a new future. And friends, I just, I just pray for you that by the power of the resurrection, you would be able to lay the past down. Now, it's important to remember when Paul's talking about leaving the past behind, he's not just talking about the bad things that have happened to him. Remember the immediate context, the list of all of his accomplishments. Come on, this will preach. The other thing he's leaving behind is all the good things that he did for the wrong reason. So friends, I would say to you, don't just leave behind the bad stuff, but leave behind the good stuff that was motivated by the wrong thing. Friends, we leave all that behind and we set our eyes to what is ahead. Paul says he is focused on one prize. Did you see it? He says, I've got one prize prize that is consuming my mind and he says it was this in verse 14 it was the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus he is focused on the eternal prize what's the eternal prize two things one to be with God forever in eternity and two the rewards that God will give his children for what we have done in service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is laser focused on that because he recognizes that all the other stuff that he has accomplished in this life is going to burn up, it's gonna stay behind, it's worthless in view of eternity, and so now he's shifted his eyes. He said, I was running this race, I was trying to get that prize, but now I realize that's the wrong race and the wrong prize, and now I'm going after this prize. I'm focused on eternity. Does Paul's race look like your race? In verse 15, Paul shifts from the first person singular, I, to the first person plural, us. He says, now let all of us think this way. He wants us to get on the right path, pursuing the right goal, and that starts with, number one, making sure that our minds are filled with what is true. Now, this is harder than you think. (laughs) This is so hard because you and I are bombarded with messages all day, every day, right? Advertising is coming at you. You get hundreds of impressions every day, and it's all saying the same message to us. If you buy this product, if you have this experience, if you go on this trip, then you'll be happy. That's what advertising is, right? And we all have experienced that. We all communicate that. But over time, listen to me, over time, it builds a lie into your mind, 
And the lie is that there is something in this world that you don't have that will finally make you content. And the, the reason that's a lie, and you know it's a lie, is because you keep getting those things and you're still not content. And so we've got to fill our minds with the truth. We've got to think about what is true. And what is true is that only those things done for Christ will last. Paul says, fill your mind with the truth. Second, follow the right examples. He writes in verse 17, follow my example, he says, but then he says this, also pay attention to all those who are following the way of Christ around you and pattern your life after theirs. If you've ever run a race, you know you don't just need a partner next to you, right, to <laughs> help you as you to keep going, but you also need a pace setter in front of you. The reason that's really important is because if you don't have a pace setter and you just run out of the gate sprinting, like you can do that for a couple of miles and then you just run out of gas. So you need someone to kind of show you, here is the pace that you need to keep so you can finish the race. In the same way, you and I have to have people in front of us who are faithfully following Jesus and going after the right prize that we are modeling our lives after. And I wanna say this to you, especially you young people, listen to me very carefully. Our culture is very confused about this. Being famous or beautiful or rich doesn't make someone worthy to follow. Being beautiful, famous or rich doesn't mean someone is worthy of following. You need a different grid. You need a grid that says, is this person godly, wise? Are they joyful? Are they living for eternity? I shared with you that last year I officiated the funeral of my 99-year-old grandmother and she was an example of this to us. One who loved the Lord, loved people, was filled with joy all the way to the end. Look for examples like that in your life. Look for examples of people that you can get behind and you know they're running the right race and going after the right destination and, and set your guidance to follow them. Third, make sure that you are ready for Christ's return. He says in verse 20, the right path is for Christians to eagerly await for the Savior's return from heaven. Again, notice the focus on eternity, not the temporary, but knowing that Christ has risen, he has ascended to the Father's right hand, and one day he will come back. Listen to me, one day he will come back. And the question for all of us, the question for all of us is if he were to return today, would we be ready? Or if he were to return this afternoon, would you say, uh, Jesus, could you go back for a minute? I've got some things I need to get in order before you come. You don't want to be in that spot, right? You want to be running your race in such a way that says if he returned, you would welcome him with open arms. And you say, I'm so glad that you have returned. That in that moment, I think it's going to get a lot more clarifying. What did I spend my time, money, energy investing in? When you see him face to face. You're going to know in that moment, was I running the right race? Stuff will get very clear very quickly. And Paul finishes by just saying, stand firm in the Lord. And this is a reminder to all of us in this room, you can be on the right path, running the right race at one time, but if you don't stay focused on the destination, you can drift. You don't even have to do a lot to drift. You just take your eyes off the destination, and all of a sudden you, start to, you wake up one day, and you're like, how did I get over here? Oh, because I'm pursuing the wrong prize. I'm not focused on the right prize. I'm going after the wrong one. So Paul finishes and says, stand firm. So this is the right race for all of us. He lays it out pretty clearly. But most powerfully to me, he ends by warning us about the wrong race. And I just want to plead with you this morning. Listen to his warning here. In verses 18 and 19, he says, there are some who live as enemies of the cross. What does that mean? Like, I'm sure they didn't think of themselves as like trying to tear down the cross or hating the cross or anything, but Paul calls them enemies of the cross. What is an enemy of the cross? What does this mean? I think what he's talking about is he's talking about those people who believed they could be saved without Jesus. If you are here and you believe that when you get to the end of your race and you cross that finish line, if you think the question is going to be, how good of a life did you live? Were you better than your neighbor? Then you are deceived about what's gonna happen at the end. 
Because at the end, the standard will not be how good of a life did you live? Because none of us measure up to the standard of God's holiness. In that moment, we're going to need someone who intercedes for us. We're going to need someone who says, they are under my care. They are covered by my blood. And that person is Jesus. And listen, if you don't think you need Jesus, if you think you've got it, I'm running this race, I've got it, I'm a good person, I'll get to the end, and God will let me into his eternal kingdom because I'm a good person. Here's what Paul says. You are an enemy of the cross because you are saying, I don't need the cross of Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you're saying, I don't need the cross, let me ask you this question, then why did Jesus die? Is he just a good example for us to follow? Is his sacrifice just a picture of laying down your life for another? That is the wrong path. That sets you up as an enemy of the cross because it says I need the cross as an example, but I don't need Jesus as a savior. Don't be there. Be in that place where you don't oppose the cross, but you say I need the cross. Second, the wrong race is following the flesh. Notice the phrase, their God is their stomach. What does he mean? (laughs) Does he mean we're all just like hungry, thinking about what we're about to eat? What he's talking about here is the stomach is a metaphor for our desires, our internal desires. And he says those who are on the wrong path, going to the wrong destination, are those who are just doing what their desires tell them to do. Now, I know you've been told your whole life, follow your heart. Follow your heart. I want to say to you, don't follow your heart. Don't follow your heart. Okay? Your heart will lead you to the wrong destination. Okay? So don't follow your heart. Follow Jesus. Okay? What the Bible says is you need to crucify your flesh. You need to kill those desires that don't honor God so that you can follow Christ. So he says to these people, he says, listen, don't follow your own internal desires because that will get you in trouble. Yes, yes. Third, the wrong race is celebrating what is shameful. We live in this generation that now celebrates the very things that God says are evil. Paul writes about this because it was happening in his day too. He writes this phrase, their glory is in their shame. What does he mean? He means that rather than turning from evil and shameful things, they glory in them. They glory in them. They're celebrating the very things that God says is wicked. And this is showing you how deep the depravity hole can go in our hearts. That we, when we're on the wrong path, we can exalt what God says is evil. We can celebrate what God says is shameful. We can ignore what God says is good and make up our own definitions. Now, this feels like progress to many modern people, but I would say to you, it's not progress. It is a very old condition of the heart called sin, and it is rebellion against God. The other thing that shows you you're on the wrong path is you are focused on earthly things. He says it very clearly. Those on the wrong path are focused on temporary things earthly things. This is what I was saying earlier in the sermon. We are wrong when we believe that temporary earthly things will satisfy eternal divine longings in our hearts. This world has many wonderful pleasures and many wonderful gifts, but none of them last forever. I want to warn you, enjoy the good gifts of God's creation with a grateful heart but don't turn anything in this world into an idol. When you do that, you are setting yourself up for disappointment. Friends, here's the question I wanna leave you with this morning. What race are you running? Two races are laid out for us in the text this morning. One race is all centered on myself. My desires, my accomplishments, my accolades, And it's all focused on one prize, which is temporary pleasure. The other race is centered on Jesus. The other race is centered on the pursuit, not of temporary pleasure, but listen to the different phrase, eternal joy. What race are you running? I believe that for every one of us, God has created us with this deep 
longing for connection with God and a deep longing for what eternally matters. And that is why this world never satisfies. Because you get all this stuff this world has, and the world overpromises and underdelivers. And so you get all this stuff, and you wait, go, wait a minute, this doesn't really meet that deepest need in my heart because this is temporary. And listen, my heart is longing for something eternal. My heart is longing for a relationship, a connection, a deeper sense of joy that cannot be taken away by the suffering of this world. The Bible describing the change of path, the change of race, uses a metaphor to describe how drastic of a change this is. And I want you to hear this phrase because it'll help you remember, oh, this is not a slight adjustment. This is two totally different races. The metaphor the Bible uses is being born again. In other words, you're born, physically born in this world, The Bible says you're born into sin, you're born into a broken world, and you're running that race. All of us, myself included, that's, we're born into that, we're running that race. And then one day by the grace of God, the spirit comes upon us and opens our eyes and shows us, wait a minute, that's the wrong race and the wrong destination. And when that moment happens and you turn in faith to follow Jesus Christ, it's such a radical change that the Bible calls that being born again. Like basically, you're not tweaking it one degree, you are starting a whole new race. You with me? Like I've been running this marathon and I realized, wait a minute, I'm in the wrong marathon in the wrong race going after the wrong destination. I've gotta leave Austin, I gotta go to Chicago and I gotta get at a different starting line to go after a different destination. It's that radical that it's called being born again. Has that happened to you? What race are you running? What prize are you pursuing? The prize at the end of the race of following Jesus is eternal joy with God. The prize at the end of the race of pursuing this world, he says it in this text, their end is destruction. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to be honest with you. The end of that path, the end of that race is not eternal joy with God, it is destruction. And friends, I don't want you to end up in that place. So this morning, we're here on Easter Sunday to celebrate that Jesus has come, he's died for us, he's risen from the dead, so we can be on the right race, the right path, headed toward the right destination. Will you pray with me? Friends, eternity is real, heaven is and hell are real. Jesus died and rose from the dead so that you could be in heaven with God forever. The invitation from the Bible is to make the decision to repent and believe. To repent, to get off the wrong path, and to believe, to get on the right path, focused on Jesus. If you're here this morning and you would like to make that decision, maybe as I've been preaching, you've had that realization, wait a minute, I'm on the wrong path, and I need to get on the right one then this morning I want you to pray with me. I want you to make that decision today. There is no greater decision you can make on Easter Sunday, 2024, than to say yes to surrendering your life to Jesus. Will you pray with me? If you're ready to make that decision this morning, I want you to pray this prayer to God from your heart. Almighty God, I confess that I've been on the wrong path, pursuing the wrong destination. Lord, I confess my sin to you today. I repent and I turn to you. I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day. And today, I make the decision to put my faith in Christ alone to save me. Help me, Lord, to follow you all of my days. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer, washing away my past, and giving me a new future and hope. 
Friends, if you prayed that with me this morning, we believe God heard your prayer, that he forgave your sin, that he poured out his spirit on you and you are born again, and that he's given you a new path and a new destination. Praise God for the gift of eternal life. Praise God for the gift of new life in Christ. Thank you that all of us who are in Christ, we are new creations. The old has gone and the new has come. If you prayed that prayer with me this morning while we're in this moment of prayer before God, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, can I ask you to slip your hand up just so I can see who made that decision to believe and trust in Jesus today? Thank you, ma'am. Who else? Raise your hand just while nobody's looking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Praise God that he's working in this place. He's touching hearts. Lord, we thank you for the transformation that comes through the power of the gospel. Lord, thank you for the new life you've poured out in our hearts and the new hope you've given us in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that even though this service will come to an end, that Jesus will still be risen. And he will still be alive. And he will still be the victor. God, thank you for saving souls today. For moving people from death to life. From darkness to light. And God, we pray just that you would seal every decision that was made today to follow Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Will you all stand with me this morning? This morning, if you made a decision to follow Christ, let me encourage you after service to also go by our welcome desk. I have a little devotional book, Your First 30 Days with Jesus, that I want to give you as a gift. And so they have those at the welcome desk. I just want to help you in starting your walk with the Lord. As I said earlier, if you're new to City View, please stop by the welcome desk as well, just so we can meet you and get to know you this morning. We are so thankful that you've been with us this morning, those of you in the room, those of you in the overflow, those of you watching from all around the state and the country. Thank you for being with us on this Easter Sunday. And I just wanna pray a blessing and a benediction over each one of you, that your eyes will stay focused on the right prize as you leave this place. Lord, I thank you for every person, every man, every woman, every student, every child who's been here with us on this special Easter Sunday. I pray, God, as they leave this place, that they would leave filled with joy in the Holy Spirit, that Jesus is risen, and he is risen indeed. Jesus, thank you for being with us, for touching our hearts and our minds this morning. And God, I pray that you will go with each person through this day. Help us to be lights for you, Jesus, as we go through this week. We love you and we honor you and we thank you, Jesus, that you save us. In your name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great day.